this was designed to uh, be a conversational interview. I'm, I'm delighted to have Rick Wagner with us. Rick and I uh, had the opportunity to overlap for one year on the Duke University Board of Trustees, uh, where I was a young trustee at the time. Rick had just joined. Uh, last week, he just uh, stepped down after his term expired as the chairman of the Board of Trustees at Duke. And I thought it was interesting because I left the board uh, right before September 11th. And Rick has now seen the evolution of a board of governors at uh, an institution like Duke for the last 12 years. And so um, I wanted to ask him some questions about his experience, but let me just give you a little bit more about Rick. Rick uh, is the former CEO of General Motors. And at the time uh, that he led General Motors, it was the largest corporation in the world. Uh, so obviously Rick has had uh, an enormous set of leadership experiences in the corporate and in higher education world. I got off the Duke board and it was announced last week that he was appointed to the board of Virginia Commonwealth University in his native Richmond. So the good news is he's continuing uh, to, to give his uh, insight to the education world. He's also on the board of the Washington Post companies and many of you know Washington Post publication obviously, uh, but that uh, organization also owns Kaplan. So Rick has been thinking about these issues from a number of different angles. So, so first of all, thank you for being here with us. Thanks. Great to be with you. Uh, and so I'll start off with a question. What's so since I saw you last on the Board of Trustees, what's happened in the last decade? So, yeah, it's, it's been, uh, been pretty busy, not just 9-11, uh, but I uh, was thinking about this question. Uh, he gave me a heads up on it on the plane yesterday, and I just started writing a list, and I culled it down to the top 10. But I think that tells you that things, I think, have changed extensively from the perspective of sort of sitting in the boardroom of a, of a uh, university. Um, First and foremost, a topic that can sometimes seem a little, a little dry and boring, but governance at universities is under much greater scrutiny than it's ever been. Um, I think it's fair to say that if one goes back um, some time ago, 10, 20 years, it was probably not as rigorous as it should be for a variety of reasons. Um, and I think that's changed, changed for the better. And I would say a lot of the best practices from, from corporate boards, audit committees, compensation committees have been, with appropriate adaptations, uh, adopted by virtually all uh, serious universities. And I think that's brought an important aspect of accountability and rigor that, that is important for institutions to be able to show that they, their constituents that they have. But also things like um, more focus on strategic planning, um, more focus on the big issues. Uh, these have, I think, in, in my view, taken more of the time of board agendas than maybe what used to be very interesting, but uh, probably not high value added sort of dog and pony shows. Here's what we're doing in this school, that school. Those things are important, but I think more and more board time is spent on strategic and governance issues. Obviously, some of this is in response to um, some developments which have been tough for, for universities. The Penn State case was obviously a unique one, but nonetheless, a lot of lessons for governance there and EPA developments of a couple years ago. Uh, a lot of discussion around financial models at universities. You've heard a lot about it today, so I won't repeat, but basically the, the revenue side, the model that we've had, um, particularly inflation plus 2% tuition increases, um, and uh, very heavy government support, state and federal levels, looks like it's under some, some uh, fairly significant pressures. And so uh, proactive conversations about, so what are we going to do as that changes? I think the smart uh, boards and universities are having, the, and ha have been having those conversations for some time so we don't have to react as suddenly. Another issue, endowments are not getting the same kind of returns they were getting. So that important source of, of income is, is changed. Um, student parent expectations have changed. Yes, in some cases for um, hot tubs or what was it, tanning salons or whatever. I haven't heard that one, but um, I would say on also on more legitimate issues, uh, service learning opportunities, global opportunities, things of that sort, uh, uh, demanding some more accountability. Um, athletics has changed a huge amount for universities with big athletic programs. Enough said on that. Global, um, whether it's more students from outside the United States at most universities, which is very good. Students here wanting to be more exposed to the world um, in constructive ways. Um, and opportunities for the universities themselves to more proactively engage um, has been an interesting development. Uh, 
I've got a few more, but let me just, just be brief. Uh, digital revolution, impact on pedagogy is a fascinating topic, which is playing out medical schools uh, and the impact of, of the changes in the health system. Government regulations have been talked about this morning and uh, obviously are talked about at boardrooms. Uh, results measures talked about today. And then finally, I would say this whole effort to try to um, engage boards and the administration um, in a much more proactive and I would say constructive conversation. And so I, I've really encouraged our President Duke, who's just a terrific guy, he's done a great job, uh, Dick Broadhead, that if there are issues that are coming up from the board that the, that the administration doesn't think are appropriate issues, let's get them on the agenda and talk about them rather than just let um, different views develop. I really find that if people are educated with similar facts, you can take a lot of the edge off what could be controversial issues. So you've been a little busy, sounds like. Um, I'm curious though, I mean, so, so as you're talking about this, it strikes me that universities uh, and K-12 school districts, I mean, you know, the, the New York City school system, who's got data, it's $23 billion a year budget, something crazy like that. I mean, there's a lot of superintendents in this country that are running billion dollar organizations. And we never think about it from that perspective. I mean, these are complex organizations, universities that have health centers in addition to, you're running hospitals. I, I'm just curious, how do you rate the level of complexity between Dick Broadhead's job running a Duke University or Josh Starr's job running uh, Montgomery Public Schools and equating it to being a Fortune 500 CEO? Well, I think, um, I think it's more complex. Um, and I think particularly if you get into the bigger universities, if you, if you have within your university a health system, I mean, this is in, the, in and of itself a very complex business. Um, intercollegiate athletics, um, how you engage with the faculty is, a, um, you know, is, for business people, is not necessarily uh, the way we might have been brought up in, in some cases. So I think the complexity is significant. I think the uh, intensity is great. I mean, during the school year, a university president and many of the Administrators really don't get weekends off. I mean, they're, you know, homecoming or this or that. Um, okay, they probably get a little longer summer break than I used to get. But uh, the point is, it's a, it's, a, it's a job that requires extraordinary skills. Um, and you, usually you take someone who is a, I, I think at, you know, most of the uh, big universities, you, you have to have someone who is by their training an academic. Um, and that person then needs to learn how to manage large organizations, financial skills, have some oversight on endowments. So you, this, is, this, is a, this is an important and difficult job, and I think it's uh, one of the things that universities could do a better job of, and I'm, I'm pleased that Duke has taken some work on, on this, is to try to uh, identify younger people who might be in administration and help them develop careers. I, I realize search processes are kind of sacred, but why not develop our own candidates for positions and maybe one of these days even have more internal candidates for the, for the senior jobs um, that would be identified through searches. But I think mm -hmm. helping people develop these capabilities are important because the difficulties in doing so, in, in running these things are, are very, very challenging. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Leadership succession is something that corporate America has been talking a lot about. They, they're very planful in that process. Higher ed, education in general, it's a little bit of a different ballgame, but not much of that conversation happening. Uh, but your idea of you know, developing leaders, it's interesting, a survey we did for Inside Higher Education recently, uh, provosts have usually been uh, the most likely to ascend to the role of president. And it turns out that according to provosts right now, only one in 10 even want to become a college president. So there's a real question of you know, who leads, what are those leadership roles, and, and, but I think developing that internal pipeline is interesting. So let's talk about one of the things everybody's been mentioning today, uh, which is that everybody thinks about college now uh, in America as the outcome being a good job. And I'm curious from your perspective, um, is that something new? I mean, has this always been the case? Is this just a heightened thing because of a bad economy lately? Or, or are we really in a different place where people are thinking about a good job as a result of college in different ways than we did, say, 20, 30, 40 years ago? Yeah, so I think it's you know, a little bit of both. I think the feeling, the focus is more intense now for the reasons that have been stated today. The investment, the cost to go to college has gone up a lot in real terms, higher than generally compensation levels have gone up. Not true in every profession, but generally true. 
and uh, the debt levels coming out are higher. So this is kind of right, right in your face. If you go out and don't have a job and you've got one of the debt burdens that, that has been discussed, I mean, this is, this is feeling a lot of pressure, and I'm sure your parents, if they're responsible, they feel that pressure too. So I don't think it's illogical that, that this, should, you know, this should be real. Um, how are universities responding? I, you know, my, my purview isn't as great as most of the speakers, but my sense is some logical ways are, um, you know, making sure that they are putting enough effort in placement departments, um, thinking about placement opportunities differently. I spent some time at Duke talking to graduate students who traditionally would have gone on into academic uh, uh, a career in biology or chemistry, you name it. And they're saying, you know, we don't have as many slots because obviously many universities are cutting back on tenured uh, faculty or more of the tenured faculty are staying longer because of the economic climate. And so they're saying, you know, we actually would like to have the opportunity to be considered once we get our master's or PhD in biology to maybe go work in the corporate world or in government agencies. But the placement systems haven't been set up to do that. And the professors that they have mentored them, they don't, they don't really know how to do that. And they sort of think that's a, maybe not, not the career they want their students to go under. So how do universities respond to that? So I think there's some things that can be done you know, without um, sort of sacrificing the soul of what, what we want universities to do that can be more responsive. Uh, but in the end, I think it's gonna flow back to this. The economic proposition is, is going to continue to be under the spotlight. Mm -hmm. Well, we're gonna hear uh, tomorrow from Andy Chan, who's at uh, Wake Forest. Uh, reinventing a lot of career services, kind of traditional thinking around placement. So th that'll be an interesting uh, contribution to the conference. Here's a good one. You know, everybody uh, in the corporate world and, and in higher ed too, to some degree, has been paying attention to Clayton Christensen, the, the famous Harvard Business School professor who uh, has specialized on disruptive innovation. And he's, he's kind of called a couple things in different industries, right? And he's been very provocative about higher ed. Uh, you know, he's come out and he's said things like, in the next 15 years, half of all higher education institutions will be extinct in the United States because of disruptive innovation in technology. So he's talking about online courses, he's talking about adaptive pathing in those things, he's talking about MOOCs, and you know, as we've seen at the board level, this has been an interesting conversation. The UVA issue where the board and the president were really not on the same page on how fast the institution should move on things like MOOCs, um, massive open online courses uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with the terminology. And um, so I'm just kind of curious whether, so I'm sure the Duke board wrestled with this, boards all over the country wrestling with this. Do you believe his, his statement about half of institutions are gonna go out of business because of this disruptive innovation? Well, I have uh, no clay and I've studied his work for years and you, you could lose a lot of money betting against what he said in, in a lot of industries. So I, I'd be, be thoughtful about doing that. Mm -hmm. I think directionally he's, he's correct. I think what he's saying is about two things. The business model is under pressure, and um, there, the technology is enabling ways to offer education, perhaps not as, as good, as complete as a four-year residential college, but um, it's gonna get better over time. And uh, if you look at industry after industry, uh, excuse me for calling education an industry, but in, in the end, it, 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 it is, um, you've seen these kind of changes, and his his studies have shown that most of the time the entrenched uh, competitors don't do well when there's disruptive innovation. I suspect what's gonna happen if, if you know, we, we lose 50% of the, of the institutions of higher learning, I'm not sure they'll all go out of business. I think you'll see consolidations. Yeah. I think you'll see partnerships. That uh, Thunderbird announcement was kind of an interesting thing the other day. Um, and, and so I think, it, it, I think it's gonna move, not as fast, I would say in most cases, panic and acting too quickly is, is probably worse than acting too slowly, but I would say we shouldn't take comfort in not, not moving forward. I should, just to, uh, I should mention that I invited Clay to come talk to the Duke board at our annual retreat where we try to take on big, big issues and, and think about the future, and uh, we were, the topic of this was the future of higher education. That's a pretty big topic. So I asked him to come down and speak, and he started out by talking about the steel, the in disruption in the steel industry, and I could see certain board members going, well, what's this all about? Yeah. By the time he was done, I wouldn't say that he had induced sufficient panic, but we did have everybody going, hey, we've really got to think about this in a different way. Yeah. He, he, he tells a good story, and 
um, I'd say, you know, he's, he's directionally right. And I think people who just say it is not, is not going to impact us are taking a huge risk. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. So to talk about that a little bit. Somebody in the audience asked about uh, partnerships and collaboration. And that was actually one of our thoughts around bringing K-12 and higher ed together. I mean, we, we have very few conversations together about the bridges that could be built between K-12 and higher ed. You know, K-12 just says, well, we're going to make them college ready without a lot of interaction on what higher ed is saying we need and, you know, vice versa. And we actually have that, I think, that same gap between higher ed and the workplace with mm -hmm. employers. It, we need to have better conversations and we need to have different collaborations and partnerships. So I was intrigued by your comment about it may not look like everybody goes out of business, but there might be collaborations, consolidation. I mean, that's kind of blasphemy to think about mergers and acquisitions in higher ed. But tell me some of your best thoughts on what that might look like. I mean, if you were uh, taking Clay very seriously, which, which you are, what would you be doing to maneuver? Maybe not just Duke, but in general, what, what ideas would be really creative to consider? Well, I wish Clay were here to answer that question because I'm sure he could do better than me. But uh, I think, um, again, using a business analogy, um, there is a fairly significant cost in some universities of the, the overhead of running the university. It's important, but it's a cost of administering the university. One could imagine two smaller institutions geographically close might merge, so you could just have one set of leadership, and so you would take out costs that you know, aren't directly involved in educating students. So I think that kind of thing is, is um, very likely. I think this issue of, um, I think the point was raised earlier uh, about if you, you don't necessarily have to offer Japanese if you can partner up with a local university. I mean, even Duke and University of North Carolina Chapel Hill are cooperating on certain programs, if you can believe that, rivals as they are. And so I think, I think. When did see, you guys authorize that? Because that would have never, <laughs> it snuck through. Something in the German department. But uh, I, I, I think, uh, actually I think it was. I'm not 100% I'm not sure I just made that up. So I think, I think those things are going to go and they're going to go at a faster rate. And they just, in a lot of cases, make a lot of sense. Um, some will be done um, out of strength proactively, and some will be done out of weakness as kind of a last, a last resort. And I think for anybody involved in administration or governments, the governance, these things work better if you can sort of see the future of your institution as best you can and say, we got to be moving in this direction, rather than saying, holy cow, our ideas were wrong. We've got we to sell the place for, for nothing. Um, which is, which is, which is no, no fun. You know, you brought up this issue of are there more angles for closer partnerships between business and universities. I think in some areas there's unbelievably good cooperation. Those tend to be, in my experience, the technical fields, engineering, yeah. um, University, or University of Michigan uh, has some great expertise in battery technology. They set up specific labs. They got, you know, plenty of corporate funding for that. Um, I, you know, I, again, with the right rules surrounding how that works, but that benefits everybody. And I think we're going to see more of those. And I think universities are, are thinking um, progressively in ways that they can do that, probably in other areas as well, that don't, you know, compromise the, the basic tenets of the importance of the way universities are run. Right. Well, so, so let me talk about this. I mean, as we're talking about an, an industry uh, that's in great upheaval uh, across education just specific to higher ed, but we're seeing it all over the place. Um, I'm curious, it was, it was interesting, I, I chuckled a little bit when Ellen mentioned uh, challenges at Marlboro relative to healthcare costs uh, and fuel costs, right? And, and I kind of leaned over to you and I said, well, you, you know a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, you know, where the obviously challenges with, uh, you know, healthcare costs of GM employees and pensions. And I mean, look, you know, healthcare is one of those things where uh, Jim Clifton, our chairman, talks about this often. The cost of healthcare in the United States is two and a half trillion dollars, which is more than the GDP of Russia, which is just almost unfathomable, right? And, and, he, and he says, we're literally going bankrupt because of our healthcare bill. So obviously this is affecting higher ed K-12, but, but I'm curious as you think about disruption in education, are there lessons that we can take from other industries that were disrupted uh, that can be applied here? I mean, what are the big takeaways from other disruption that yeah. we need to be aware of? Yeah, I think it's a good, good question. I won't digress into the healthcare discussion. That's interesting in and of itself. But just broadly, I would say, um, so this is a time of significant change. Obviously, from today's panels, panelists, we've heard different views on how that change might take place. But 
it is going to be, I think, a very interesting, challenging next 10 years, but an also a period of great opportunity in, in, in education. So in those kind of periods, you need strong leadership. And uh, I'm talking about the senior administration of, of universities and schools and school districts, but also the, the governing boards of those mm -hmm. groups, and there needs to be good alignment. Um, so I'd start with strong leadership. Any, any successful restructuring or turnaround has to have that. Um, second of all, I, you need to be proactive in trying to get out ahead of things. Um, doesn't mean you, sh you have to bet, bet the ranch, and I would say the more proactive you are, um, the more you reduce the probability that you have to make sudden changes because mm -hmm. you can make them more gradually. Right. So I, for example, it, I was an advocate at Duke. I didn't, we didn't really have to push because our provost was very into it, but let's get into a few of these MOOCs Let's see how it goes. It doesn't cost a lot. Let's see what we learn. And guess what? We found a couple things that immediately seemed to work great to the point we could even bring the, some of those ideas and use them in, in our own courses. And other things that sounded pretty great, and then after five minutes you go, well, this, who thought of this dumb idea? But it wasn't a big bet. So, so you can go and learn and get out, and as I say, get in the game and start playing. And then when the game starts moving in that direction, you're, you're going to have a step up a step ahead of people who have just been sitting back and watching. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to get in the game. You want to get a, try to get ahead of where you think it's going without, without um, overcommitting. And at the same point, you don't want to bet the ranch because um, a lot of times, and this is true, I saw in the corporate world a million times, you, had, you thought you saw clearly where things needed to go. And if you bet too far down the road, you find, well, it's generally going in that direction, but you needed a few zigs and zags to really get to exactly the right point. So start early so you don't have to bet the ranch, but be aggressive. And um, the other thing, the leadership it needs to bring their team along. So in this case, administration, faculty, alumni, students, and, and make them part of the change. And so rather than argue, um, should we be engaged in MOOCs or should we embrace all the opportunities of digital education and how do we, we should talk about what are the best practices there, what can make us better, um, how can we free up more time of professors to work in, on small research projects with students, how can we use this opportunity presented um, to make us better and engage people in it because otherwise you can get some people who just on principle are either for it, blindly for it, blindly against it, and you waste a lot of time sort of not working out the direction that inevitably I think you're going to go. And, and, and I guess related to this and implied in my earlier comments, the whole issue of really embracing and using technology in a smart way is, you know, in every business, and I think certainly education has done a lot of this, if we think back to what it was like when, when I was a kid in school, um, and I think just an, a constructive attitude, here's a new technology, how can we use this to improve our product, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, if people think about that way, leadership thinks about that way, you kind of get over this kind of yes or no and more on how can we be smart about using it, adding it in to the right, at the right pace, at the right cost, to, mm -hmm. so we can offer a better product to, uh, to, to, to our students and to the parents and things of that sort. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, your, your idea about uh, taking small bets on innovation, being proactive, it, it reminded me of Tony's comments earlier about giving students and teachers that 20% time to innovate, right? I mean, you know, to take small bets, not bet the ranch on it all, but to have that opportunity to think about applying it, you know, technology in new ways and the freedom to do that. And um, so that, that's, I think, interesting advice for us. So hey, let me give you an example of yeah. that. It's very interesting to me how you saw it in person. So Duke set up a joint venture medical school at, with the National University of Singapore hmm. about five, six years ago, seven years ago. Um, because they were doing that, they actually went out and hired, they took some Duke faculty over, but they hired a bunch of people who were known to be deep thinkers on new ideas, best practices in education. So they actually, while, while providing the same content that one would get at the Duke Med School in Durham, North Carolina, they changed a lot of the ways it was delivered. And I won't go into it, you all would be familiar with it, but it turned out to be significantly more effective. Hmm. Um, and so now what's happened is those ideas are being brought back to the medical school at Duke, but not just that. The, the people who put it in it at the Duke NUS came in and presented to the Duke faculty and the chair of the biology department said, you know, 
we can use that for undergraduate biology. And so, it, I mean, it just goes to show you, you don't have to say, hey, everybody in the med school, them, you know, all places we're gonna do all this at once. Let's, this is an opportunity at Duke and US to do something different. Let's try it, it works great. Let's bring it back and see how it could fit in, parts of it fit in other places. And, and that builds a lot of confidence um, in the faculty, not unanimous confidence, but a lot of confidence that, oh, yeah, it's okay, we can do this. We've got an example of where it works and I've, I've got an idea to make it better, by the way. And so I think that, that this idea of small bets um, helps to build confidence in a time of change. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask this last question before we break for lunch. So a lot of this, as you kind of mentioned, is hinges on great leadership, right? I mean, it, shared governance, which is an interesting model in higher ed, and you can argue shared governance in K-12 too, but you know, the dynamic between board, picking the right leader. So, so let me just ask this question. I mean, your confidence that the average college president, for example, is the right leader for the next 10 years. I mean, it's great that you feel good about uh, Dick Broadhead, right? But what's your confidence interval on, do we have the right leadership? And if we don't, how do we develop it? Where do we find it? I mean, I'm really interested in that question because it, it, the dynamics have changed so much that you could argue that those who just had an academic background, uh, which we think of as the leaders of higher ed, uh, does that cut it? I mean, I'm just curious, you're, your vote of confidence in the current leadership of education today. Yeah, I think there's some examples of, in certain uh, institutions, of successful presidents who, who haven't come from an academic background. But I think if you talk about, you know, the, the, the kind of more uh, significant private and public universities, I, I still think it's, it's pretty important. Um, I, my impression, I mean, I, I haven't surveyed all the university presidents. I suspect it's the case like it is for corporate CEOs. There's a few that are outstanding that'll succeed in any environment. There's a few that probably shouldn't be there today and certainly won't be good in the future environment. And the vast bulk of them with the right uh, training, support, interaction with their board. And again, this assumes that the boards are all yeah. well constructed and, and effectively functioning, which maybe not always true, but let, let's hope it is. You know, they're, they're, they will get through this. Um, and they, some of them will become great leaders, maybe better leaders and as the world evolves, and some will eventually say, hey, this is not really the kind of thing that I'm comfortable with, and maybe they, they should be moved. But I, I think it would be uh, simplistic to say the problem here is that we don't have good leadership at our universities. I think by and large, the U, Again, and I, I apologize for a limited sample sign, but I, I, know, I know maybe 20 university presidents. I'd say that, by and large, they strike me as pretty good. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure if you ask them, and I you know you've done some work in this, what do they think about their boards? Some of them would say, I got an outstanding board. Yeah. Some would say, well, pretty good. Some would say, boy, that's pretty doggy. Um, and so I think uh, the way those board, boards are formulated need to be continually reviewed. And I took it at Duke, I had a, a, ran the trusteeship committee for the four years before I was chair. I took it very seriously and we looked and we said, okay, we know when people are gonna leave the board, we had a term or age limit. Um, and we knew, okay, so we're, we want some people with medical experience, we know we're gonna lose this person at this point, mm -hmm. who are potential candidates. And I think it's very important that boards do that kind of planning as well. Um, because that's, that's particularly on the most strategic issues, that's an important half of the equation along with the administration. Right, well I'm glad you mentioned that. So tomorrow we will be announcing fresh results from our college presidents panel, which includes about 20% of the college presidents in the US, and our superintendents panel, uh, which is about 20% of the superintendents, we asked some questions about their boards. So uh, we'll leave you hanging until tomorrow's session on that. Um, I wanna go ahead and uh, thank Rick for uh, being here very much. Thanks, appreciate that, thank you. Thank you, thanks very much.